In ancient Greece, the treatment of disease was based more on philosophy than in genuine understanding of human anatomy. Surgical procedures were rare, and human dissection was not an accepted practice. As a result, physicians had little first-hand information about the inside of the human body. It wasn't until the Renaissance that the science of human anatomy was born. A Belgian physician, Andreas Vesalius, shocked many by deciding to investigate anatomy by dissecting human bodies, bodies that he was often forced to procure under cover of night. For medical students like Vesalius who wanted to dissect, they had to just find bodies from outside of the legal channels. Once Vesalius became a professor at Padua, the person in charge of executions was actually a friend of his, so Vesalius could even go in and observe the living prisoners who were waiting execution and say, I want that one, I want that one, and, and then the person would be executed. According to Dr. Bailabil, Vesalius was determined to pass on the first-hand knowledge that he had gained from his skillful dissections by writing a book on human anatomy. The result was his De Humani Corporis Fabrica, on the structure of the human body. First published in 1538, Fabrica is considered one of the greatest books in medical literature. It's regarded as one of the greatest discoveries in medicine because it contains the first accurate description of the interior of the human body. This was the first major challenge to the authority of the ancient Greek physicians. The book had a great sale that must have been to a wealthy, literate public that went far beyond the medical profession. And the pictures are very elaborately keyed in with the written text, so it just made knowledge of human anatomy much more accessible. Thanks to Vesalius, the study of human anatomy through dissection became an essential component of medical training and helped lead to our next great discovery. The human heart, a muscle the size of a fist, beating more than 100,000 times a day, over two billion heartbeats by the time you turn 70, pumping more than five gallons of blood a minute. Blood flows through the body, traveling a complex highway of arteries and veins. It's estimated that if all the blood vessels in just one human body were placed in a line, they'd reach some 60,000 miles, more than twice around the Earth. But in the early part of the 17th century, how blood works in the body was misunderstood. The prevailing theory was that it ebbed and flowed through the heart by way of pores in the soft tissue. Among those who believed in this theory was an English physician named William Harvey. He was fascinated with the workings of the heart. The more he studied the beating hearts of animals on his dissecting table, the more he realized the accepted theory of blood flow couldn't be right. Quite explicitly, he says, I began to think whether the blood might have a motion, as it were, in a circle. And then he begins a new paragraph, and he says, and this I afterward found to be true. In his dissections, Harvey observed that the heart had one-way valves that kept the blood flowing in one direction. Some valves let the blood in, while others let it out. Here was his great discovery. The heart, he realized, was pumping blood into the arteries, where it then circulated through the veins, coming full circle back into the heart, ready to start the cycle all over again. Today, it's obvious that blood circulates in the human body. But in the 17th century, William Harvey's discovery was revolutionary. This was really striking at the very core of traditional medical ideas. And at the end of his treatise, Harvey says, when I think of the countless implications that this will have for medicine, I see a field of almost unlimited possibilities. Harvey's discovery led to major advances in anatomical research and surgery, and simple, life-saving ones, too. 
In operating rooms and trauma centers around the world, surgical clamps are used to stem the flow of blood and keep a patient's circulation intact. A simple device, but each one a reminder of William Harvey's great discovery. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns one aspect in the field of physiology. The object in point, a legal contract. It's dated October 19, 1832. It represents an agreement never duplicated in the history of man. The case in point, Alexis St. Martin, 19-year-old French-Canadian, occupation fur trapper. On the sixth day of June in the year 1822, he reached the trading post at Fort Mackinac, Michigan. Awaiting him there were money and trade goods in exchange for his fur. Also awaiting him was a most unusual destiny. Go to the hospital, get Dr. Beaumont. Hurry. Thus, in the early afternoon of June 6, 1822, William Beaumont, M.D., an obscure army surgeon pursuing his profession in the far reaches of the Michigan wilderness, strode into the crude back room of the Mackinac trading post and raised the curtain on one of the most admirable and most important dramas ever enacted in the field of medical science. And that drama is still with us today, every last detail, carefully annotated and preserved in William Beaumont's own handwriting. These are his words. This is his story, as he himself set it down. Being then stationed at the garrison on the island, I was immediately called to the relief of Alexis St. Martin. When I arrived at the place, I found him senseless and apparently in a moribund state. The shotgun charge, consisting of powder and duck shot, was received in the left side at close distance. It had blown off and fractured the sixth rib about the middle anteriorly, fractured the fifth rib, ruptured the lower portion of the left lobe of the lungs, and lacerated the stomach by a spicula of the rib that was blown through its coat. I also noted a portion of the lungs protruding through the external wound. Immediately below this, a portion of the stomach protruded. There was a puncture in this portion large enough to receive my forefinger. Alexis St. Martin, is that correct? Yeah. Came in early this morning. They say he's from Montreal, came down with one of the expeditions. Anyone with him? Friend or relative? No, he was alone. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, it was an accident, we're sure of that. I want him moved to the post hospital as soon as possible. And get a letter, take him to the hospital. You think he still has a chance with a wound like that? I don't think he can live more than 36 hours. In the meantime, I still intend to do everything possible to keep him alive. Before moving the patient, St. Martin, I attempted to reduce the portions of the lungs and stomach which protruded from the wound. I found the lung was prevented from returning by the sharp point of the fractured rib, over which its membrane had caught fast. But by raising up the lung with the front finger of my left hand, I clipped off with my penknife and my right hand the sharp point of the rib, which enabled me to return the lung into the cavity of the thorax. After giving the wound a superficial dressing, the patient was moved to the post hospital. And in about an hour, I attended to dressing the wound more thoroughly, not supposing it probable for him to survive the operation of extracting the fractured spicule of bones and other extraneous substances. But to my utter astonishment, he bore it without a struggle or without sinking. After that, I applied over the wound a carbonated fermenting poultice, changing it once every 8, 10, or 12 hours. The desired effect was achieved in less than 84 hours with a lively reaction commencing in about 24 hours. This reaction was accompanied with strong arterial action and high inflammatory symptoms of the system generally, more especially of violent pneumonia and inflammation of the lungs. Oh, oh, help me, won't you, the pain, oh, St. Bell, help Alexei. All right, son, lie pain. quietly. Pain. Another few minutes and I'll let you alone. Oh, doctor, in what 
Pete. Pete. I told you to lie quietly. Now do as I say. I die. What? Please. You also please. Get please. He was here this afternoon. He'll be back again tonight. I die. I don't want death. I pray. Not here. So far away from Mario. Big trees. But the white river. Big, big land. My own. So far away. My family. You must play, doctor. No death. Not let me die. No, Alexis, your life is not all within my power. But for myself, I promise you, I won't let you die. 8th of June. The fever continues, and there has been no reaction from the bowels at all. Everything the patient takes into his stomach is either absorbed or makes its exit from the wound in the stomach externally. The protruded portions of the lungs and the lacerated section of the stomach have sloughed off, leaving the large puncture of the stomach plain to be seen. The patient thus far has experienced no sickness or irritability of the stomach, not even nausea. Do you know what, William? I just don't know. It's just so hard to take hold of. Imagine. By all that's right, that boy should have been dead days ago. I'm surprised as you, Deborah, but the fact remains he's very much alive. But if he's in torture, I mean, all that suffering, all the pain, Half his stomach open. What reason? You know he can't live. Where life is, I try to persuade it to remain. I succeed, I fail. And the final voice is never mine. But this poor boy, what possible hope is there? I don't know. The hopeful, the hopeless. It's a grave question, but it's not my field. I'm a medical doctor, not a philosopher. I'm not much of a businessman, either. There, there aren't too many that are pressing. Just three or four here. And this one. Well, and maybe this one here. And this one. It's really not too pressing. Is it, William? Don't you worry now. You hear? It's going to be all right. I don't think so, Deborah. And I'm not worried much. So it continued. The townspeople stood by and waited for Alexis to die. But the waiting stretched into days, weeks, then months. Alexis hung on desperately. He would not die. Dr. Beaumont examined and treated the patient daily recording every step, every observation, down to the smallest detail. So complete, so thorough are his notes, that even today they would be a credit to the finest hospital in the world. The 27th of June. After three weeks, his appetite is now regular. The stomach has shown not the least disposition to close its puncture by granulations. The 18th of July. The sixth rib, which was worst injured and blown off entirely in the first place, has become curious or decayed at its fractured extremity. I have been obliged to amputate it about midway between sternum and spine. I did this by dissecting around, separating and retracting the intercostals to the sound portion of the rib, and then sewing it off with a very narrow, sharp saw, which I made for the occasion. The operation succeeded admirably. To retain food and drink as much as possible, I have kept to the opening in the stomach a firm compress of lint 
fitted to the shape and size of the puncture and confined by straps of adhesive. Under these dressings, digestion is as completely performed as in the most healthy person in the vicinity. I am even able to see digestion go on each time I dress the wound. After trying every means within my power to close the puncture of the stomach without the least appearance of success, I gave over trying. 28th of April. Today I have been informed by authorities of the town that they're not able nor are they required to further provide for Alexis St. Martin. He is a pauper, no friends, no money. They propose to pack him off in an open canoe to his native place, Montreal, nearly 2,000 miles distant. My protest against such inhuman disposal of a person are of no avail, even though the authorities are aware it will mean death for him. Happy are they that die in the poorhouse of this town. In my opinion, the public officers of the town would sooner pay a round sum for the extinction of a pauper than to make an exertion or take any trouble to procure the necessary assistance. Don't you think that's a bit strong, William? They really have a good excuse. They say the charity fund is low. The town just can't afford it. Alexis St. Martin's a human being. Because he lacks property doesn't make him less worthy of life than the rest of us. Oh, no, I imagine it doesn't. May the Lord deliver us from evil. And what greater evil could befall a human being than to become dependent on the charity of this town in time of distress? It certainly is too bad, William. I wish there was something I could do. Oh, there's something we both can do. Something we must do. We'll take him in with us. We'll give him lodging and anything else he should need. Oh, but how can we afford it, William? I don't mean to be selfish, but it means feeding him, clothing him, other things. How could we do it? You know the bills we have already. How could we do it? We must do it. No one else will. You clear out the attic. I'll move him in tomorrow morning. Yes, William. Just as you say. William Beaumont took Alexis into his own family in 1823 and remained with him almost two years. During this time, despite his salary of $40 a month, Beaumont nursed him, fed him, clothed him, furnished him with every comfort, and dressed his wounds twice a day. Then one night in the early months of 1825, suddenly, unexpectedly, the first glimmering of the grand idea came to him. When he lies on the opposite side, I can look directly into the cavity of the stomach and almost see the process of digestion. It is my observation that this case affords an excellent opportunity for the experimenting upon the gastric fluids and process of digestion. It would give no pain nor cause the least uneasiness. I may therefore be able hereafter to give some interesting experiments on these subjects. I have now found that I can pour water into the stomach with a funnel or put in food with a spoon and draw them out again with a siphon. I have frequently suspended meat and other substances into the stomach perforation to ascertain the length of time to digest each. At one time, I used a tent of raw beef instead of lint to close the opening in the stomach and found that in less than five hours it was completely digested off as if it had been cut with a knife. As the days follow, the patient becomes more discontent with his lot, not entirely without reason. All manner of digestible and indigestible objects are poked into the orifice of his stomach. He must fast for hours, lie in certain positions for long periods, and all this for the sake of medical science, in which the patient himself has not the slightest interest. Experiments began and continued in the year of 1825. The grand idea had come into being. It was only a start, a beginning, but it proved a firm foundation on which the obscure army surgeon erected his structure of incontrovertible truth. And as history will support, the final truths recognized were not easily attained. In the midst of some of Beaumont's most important experiments in late summer of the same year, Alexis St. Martin chose to embark on another of his vacations without leave. In the face of things, there was nothing the good doctor could do but wait and hope for the return of his most unreliable, yet most valuable subject. And in time, he did return. Dr. Malnami! 
I know you weep. I know you would be here. Ah, uh, this room. Same old place. I know you would wait for Alexi. You say nothing. I go away, I come back, and you say nothing, you do not welcome Alexi. Where have you been? To see some friends. Friends here, there, all over I got friends. And I have good time, doctor, very good time. We sing, we drink, we dance. Alexi have big old time. You should have seen it, mon ami. You should see it. You knew I needed you. Why did you leave? Doctor, to see some friends. Something wrong? I see it all the time. What difference if I go? It makes a lot of difference. You know that. I know nothing. What do I know of these, these things that you do to me? What for I should do it? To me, it is nothing. Why? Because you agreed to, that's why. You gave me your word. Then I take back the word. No more. I do it no more. You push, you poke, here, there, you put things in, you take things out. For me, this is no good. Only you. You find out all about Alexi's stomach. Maybe this is what you want. This is not what I want. Then what is it? What do you want? I don't know. I do not know. This I know I do not want. Maybe it's better if you give me some money. We, oui. you give me money, I not go. That's good, no? What I give you now is all I can spare. I have no more. I have a family to raise, remember? This is no good. That's bad. Mon ami, I like you. You are smart in the head. But also, I like the money. I need it. Doctor, we are businessmen, no? To you, I sell the stomach. To me, you give the money. This is all right. You not give me money, I not stay. This is bad, no good. You give me money, I stay. No money, I go. Doctor, mon ami. Be quiet. You drunken lout. You selfish, miserable, drunken lout. I'm sick of you. You dare to come to my house in the middle of the night stinking of whiskey. Stumbling in here, bargaining and shouting at me to buy something you should be glad to give away free. Doctor. I told you to be quiet, do you hear? I don't want to hear another word from you. You have a short memory, Alexis. Do you remember moaning on a cot over at the post hospital? While I stood attending you, moaning that you were dying. No death, no death. Je vous en bleu. Do not let me die, doctor. Remember that? Do you remember the days and the weeks that I took care of you? Every day? The weeks, the months, the years? The surgery. Working night after night to find a dressing that would keep your stomach covered so that you could stay alive. Do you remember that, Alexis? Do you? All right, and what did I do after I attended you, my friend? What did I do every day after I had dressed your wounds, fed you, comforted you? Did I come to you and say, Alexis, I do not like this, I want money, we are businessmen? Either you pay or you die? Did I ever say that to you? Did I ever say that, Alexis? Did I ever say anything like that? No. All right, my friend. Then why do you say it? Why do you ask this of me? It's the money, Doctor. I need the money. You've needed money ever since I met you. I gave you all the help and care and medical attention I could, but I never asked you for money. When you were put out of the hospital because you were a pauper, you couldn't pay. My wife and I, we took you into our home. Food, clothing, everything you needed. And did we come to you and say, Alexis, we want money? Either you give us money or we'll put you in a canoe for Montreal. And most likely you will die on the way. 
Is that what we said, Alexis? Does that sound like anything we ever said? No. Then why do you ask these things of me? Why do you ask these things of me? Alexis, it has been a long time since we first came together. Years. Time and again, I've tried to explain to you what it is I'm trying to do. I know it was difficult for you, the language, the science. But I hoped you had realized at least how much this can mean, how important it can be. Can't you see it, my friend? Can't you realize it? For the first time in medical history, day by day, we are gifted with the sight of a vital organ in action within a human body. Never has such a thing been known or seen, but it has happened. It is happening now to us, you and me. Think of what this can mean, what we can do, what we can accomplish for everybody in the world to come. How much sickness we can prevent, disease. From what we learn from you, how much suffering and ignorance and death can we conquer? There are no limits, no boundaries. Your accident, this opening in your side, will make your name famous throughout the ages of man. Can't you realize this, Alexis? Alexis. Things temporarily restored to normal and the inevitable hangover given expert treatment, the experiments continue. Experiments which were successfully executed almost in the depths of the wilderness, without knowledge for research or special education in the field of chemistry, without the aid and resources of shining up-to-date chrome and stainless steel laboratories, but with the most crude and primitive instruments and equipment, most of which he had to fashion with his own hands, transferred from one army community to another, from Fort Mackinac and from thence to Fort Niagara, somehow managing to persuade his prized patient, Alexis, to accompany him, the $40 a month army surgeon, the grand physiologist from America's backwoods, plotted on and on with his experiments. And then while at Fort Niagara, there came one fateful day late in August of 1825. Oh? And one of the neighbors saw him on the road last night. Alexis told him he was leaving you. He didn't know where he was going, but he was leaving you for good. So he was gone. Alexis, the prized patient, the reluctant, unthinking backwoodsman, who unwittingly, perhaps unwillingly, served all humanity. Beaumont was stricken, but he decided to give to the world the results of the experiments he had made, medical facts and findings, which today, as they did then, profoundly affect the lives and health of every one of us. In August of the year 1829, after four years of constant seeking and searching, Beaumont located Alexis St. Martin in Lower Canada, and after much correspondence and many promises, finally persuaded him to return to him. And Alexis did return, with children and with a wife for whom he demanded steady employment. Thus the experiments resumed where they had left off too abruptly four years before. Even though a legal contract was drawn between the two men, it made no difference to Alexis. Soon there would be the usual drunken sprees. Again, the impossible demands for more money, more luxuries, more everything. And as suddenly as before, in the early months of 1834, Mon ami Alexis made his final departure into Lower Canada. The last entry was made. A chapter of American medical history had come to an end. William Beaumont never saw Alexis St. Martin again. The one-time army surgeon who rose to the heights finally settled in St. Louis, Missouri. And there on a clear spring morning, the 25th of April, 1853, his last breath was recorded. A few years later, the body of his beloved wife, Deborah, was also laid to rest. And there, in modest graves, they sleep together, side by side. William Beaumont, M.D., whose life work takes his place among the most important physiological experiments of his or any other age. Most of our knowledge of the human stomach today is traceable directly to detailed studies and observations of America's backwoods physiologist, knowledge which establishes a broad foundation for the treatment of all the various disorders of the stomach, organic and functional. Knowledge which permits life-saving surgery of the stomach and abdomen, never before dreamed of. All from a crude 19th century dwelling in the backwoods of Michigan. William Beaumont, M.D., 1785-1853.
In the summer of 1822, a French-Canadian fur trapper named Alexis St. Martin was going about his business near Lake Michigan when he was shot by a hunter. Right in the stomach. The wound was severe, and everyone expected St. Martin to die that night. But he didn't. A local army doctor named William Beaumont kept him alive. In fact, Beaumont performed so many surgeries on the injury over the next several months that he decided, somewhat questionably, to just keep St. Martin's stomach wound open. St. Martin was left with a hole, or fistula, in his abdominal wall, which allowed anyone to see right into his stomach. Now, it's probably hard to work as a fur trapper with a hole in your guts, but Beaumont saw, or possibly created, an opportunity. He hired St. Martin technically as a handyman, but really as a guinea pig. Over the next several years, and some 238 experiments, Beaumont recorded what St. Martin ate and what his stomach did to his meals. Sometimes they just skipped the eating part altogether and just shoved some food tied to a string right into the guy's gut hole. Beaumont took samples of gastric juices and had them analyzed by chemists, something no one had ever done before. And he also noticed that St. Martin's digestion slowed at certain times, like when he was sick or stressed. I mean, like, beyond the stress of having a gaping hole in your abdomen. Through his somewhat questionable research, Beaumont discovered some major secrets of the digestive system, like that the stomach's extremely strong acids and muscular contractions break down food, and that some foods are more digestible or less digestible than others, and that the brain can affect the stomach. Beaumont's findings, as well as his methods of clinical observation, revolutionized the field of physiology. And St. Martin? Don't worry about him. He lived to be 83 years old, had great health and a hole in his guts. Now, I sincerely hope that you can't actually see what's going on in your stomach, but let me tell you, the story there is epic. In your digestive system's mission to disassemble food into its tiniest, most basic molecular forms, the stretch that runs from your mouth to your stomach unleashes all of the mechanical and chemical powers at its disposal. It physically roughs up food, douses it in protein-loving acid-triggered enzymes, reduces it all into a creamy paste, and as a bonus, because it likes you, it also kills a whole host of harmful invaders that, for whatever reason, found their way through your face and into your tube. But your stomach's not the end of the line for your food. Unless... It is. I mean, most of the time, everything from your mouth to your stomach prepares food to be absorbed by your tissues, but sometimes food finds its way back up. Yeah, in case the story of Alexis St. Martin didn't make you want to do this already, now I'm talking directly about vomiting. Let's begin with the beginning, with your mouth, aka your oral or buccal cavity. Now we don't usually think of it this way, but that is where digestion starts. The mechanical and chemical breakdown of food through chewing and enzyme action. The inside of your mouth is lined with a tough, thick layer of stratified squamous epithelium that can stand up to lots of friction, like getting scraped by tortilla chips and like grilled cheese sandwiches that maybe were cooked a little too much on the top. Your anterior hard palate and the flexible posterior soft palate form the roof of your mouth. The hard palate provides like a hard surface for the tongue to mash food against, while the soft palate forms a movable fold of flesh that reflexively closes off the nasopharynx when you swallow, so food gets directed down your esophagus and not up into your nasal cavity. We all know what teeth are for, and you have roughly 32 of them in your basic types that help you masticate or chew your food. The tongue lives on the floor of your mouth and is basically just a big muscle that grips and constantly repositions your food as you chew. The resulting ball of mush actually has its own special name. It's a bolus, and the tongue rolls it back to the pharynx in preparation for swallowing. But that's just the physical action that goes on in your mouth. Just as much destruction is taking place through chemistry. The bolus is broken down with the help of three major pairs of salivary glands that churn out an average of 1.5 liters of slightly acidic saliva every day. More than four soda cans worth of spit! Per day. And all that saliva delivers enzymes like salivary amylase, a digestive enzyme that breaks down starches into glucose monomers. Now once the food enters the pharynx, it's propelled by peristalsis into the esophagus, which except for the little sphincter at the end that keeps food moving in the right direction, is really just a glorified laundry chute lined with smooth muscle. The only time you probably even remember that you have an esophagus is when something's stuck in there, or if you're feeling intense heartburn, or if you just puked. But Moving on. Assuming you have not just puked, then the bolus moves on to Dr. Beaumont's ticket to fame, the stomach. The stomach is the stretchiest part of your digestive tube, capable of holding two to four liters of material at any given time. Two to four liters! That is a lot of nachos! 
mixed with spit. But of course it's much more than just a storage tank. It's lined with the same four main layers found through most of the GI tract, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa, but it's got a few special modifications. For one thing, the muscularis includes an additional layer of smooth muscle that gives it extra strength, allowing the stomach not just to hold materials, but to actively smush them around. And the inner mucosa is made up almost entirely of mucus cells, which produce a protective coat that keeps the stomach tissues from getting digested along with your lunch. This inner lining is dotted with millions of tiny deep gastric pits which lead down to tubular gastric glands. These glands in turn contain various types of secretory cells that brew up some of the most potent chemicals in your body. For example, your stomach has parietal cells that release hydrochloric acid, a substance more acidic than battery acid, which lays waste to most of the bacteria, viruses, and other stuff that could make you sick. It also helps denature or change the shape of proteins to make it easier for enzymes to digest. Them. And maybe more importantly, when the hydrochloric acid is combined with pepsinogen, an inactive enzyme that's secreted by another kind of stomach cell called chief cells, the mixture creates the protein digesting enzyme pepsin. Together, this superpowered acid and protein hungry enzyme can annihilate nearly anything they encounter. This was apparently something that Beaumont observed firsthand by dropping hunks of meat into a cup filled with St. Martin's personal gastric fluids. He watched the gobbets of food dissolve over time, which is Partly how he discovered the stomach's role in digestion was as much chemical as mechanical. But with so much mind-blowingly powerful stuff at your stomach's disposal, somebody down there has to be in charge, so your gastric glands also contain enteroendocrine cells. These cells release regulatory hormones like serotonin and histamine, which act locally to trigger other cells to, say, release more acid or contract muscle tissue. And when the time comes to tamp the action down, they secrete other hormones like somatostatin to inhibit secretions. And then there are G-cells, which produce the most important hormone for stimulating gastric activity, gastrin. Most signals that increase stomach activity get the job done by increasing the secretion of gastrin, which then stimulates the release of other gastric fluids as well as stomach muscle activity. Now, if the smell of baking cookies has ever made your mouth water and your belly grumble, then it might not surprise you to learn that these stomach secretions are ruled by neural mechanisms as well as hormonal ones. In fact, stomach secretion occurs in three phases based on where the food is sensed. The brain the stomach, and the small intestine. The cephalic phase is the one ruled by your brain, and it kicks in when you first see, smell, taste, or even think about food. That sensory input gets relayed to the hypothalamus, which stimulates the medulla oblongata, which then taps the parasympathetic fibers in the vagus nerve. From there, the signals are sent to the stomach with the word that, hey, we think that maybe cookies are on the way, so you might want to prepare yourself. Now, this is a conditioned reflex, so it only works if you want to eat the food in question. If I happen to be super full, or not feeling well, or somebody puts a pile of squid eyeballs in front of me, the cephalic phase isn't gonna happen. And no offense if squid eyeballs are totally your thing, they're just not my thing. But say I eat the plate of squid eyeballs anyway, because, you know, I'm trying to be polite. Well, even without the cephalic warm-up, when that food hits my stomach, local mechanisms, both neural and hormonal, jumpstart the gastric phase. For the next few hours, as my stomach grows distended from the food, it activates stretch receptors that, again, stimulate my medulla and get my vagus nerve to tell my stomach to turn up the juice. At the same time, the secretion of gastrin is activated by other signals, like the rise in alkalinity caused by the stomach acid getting neutralized as it does its job. Conversely, as stomach acidity increases, it inhibits the release of gastrin. Now, the third phase of gastric regulation, the intestinal phase, speeds or slows the rate in which your stomach empties so that the small intestine doesn't get too overloaded with too much acid or with the creamy paste that your stomach turns your food into, also known as chyme. Now, remember, not a lot of absorption actually occurs in the stomach. The stomach is more like a decontamination tank. Sure, it pummels your food down to a paste, but it's also where your body tries to obliterate any nasties that could make you sick. As long as food is still in there, your body has a chance to kind of size it up and feel it out, and it reserves the right to eject anything that it feels is potentially dangerous. Lots of factors can trigger the stomach's urge to purge or vomit, but the most common are simply ingesting too much food or eating some kind of irritant or toxin, like those produced by bad bacteria, too much alcohol, certain drugs, or unappealing foods. Of course, if you've ever puked in a moment of trauma or stress, you know how emotions and anxiety can also trigger your stomach to launch its lunch. That's the brain influencing the cephalic phase of gastric regulation again by sending extra fight-or-flight signals to the stomach. Beaumont noticed this mind-stomach connection whenever St. Martin's digestion was affected by illness or stress. Something you'd think he'd have felt every time that doctor came at him with some meat. 
on a string. If you were able to keep down your lunch today, you learned how mechanical and chemical digestion start in the mouth and continue in the stomach, where food is pummeled by acids and enzymes and turned into chyme. We also looked at the stomach's cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases of digestive regulation. Thank